everyone and welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Kelly Lavelle, and this week I'm joined by our expert guest, Lindsay Mast, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit about redefining networking. Lindsay is the founder of Ladies America. Ladies America is a national network of professional women who help each other advance both their careers and personal lives. With the mantra of women helping women, the organization aims to redefine networking in a variety of ways. Starting headquarters off in Washington, D.C., the organization has since grown its presence to cities across the country, such as New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and more. I'm really excited to have Lindsay a part of Bridging the Gap today. Thank you again for joining us. Could you perhaps start us off by sharing a little bit of your journey and how you got started? So Ladies uh, Then DC was started um, really just from my own personal desire to connect with women in Washington, DC. I had uprooted myself from Austin, Texas and drove my Jeep loaded up to Washington and on my long drive to DC, I was running through my mind, what are some things that I can do to improve my life? Because I'm going to this new city and I was treating it much like you would a new year, a new year's resolution. And the one thing that kept coming to my mind was that I really needed to develop skills on how to work with women because I had had just instance after instance where it just felt like a struggle. It was just odd. And I had the support of men I knew that, but women, I didn't have it. I, I just thought it's a slippery slope. You can never really succeed. This is the line that can go into my mind. I could never really succeed. And that it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their, them to blame. It was my burden to bear. I was going to figure out so when I first moved to DC, in a large part, it was I didn't want to fail and put my head down in shame and go back home to Texas. So I was going to succeed in Washington, DC. And so when I moved, um, I asked the first five women that I met, uh, there was no rhyme or reason to it. They were all different backgrounds and you know, small variety of ages. And I enjoyed the dinner so much and I was really using it as a personal experiment. like how do I interact with them? How much can I talk about? You know, what, how much good can I tell them without them feeling jealous? And how much bad can I tell them without sounding like I'm moping? And uh, just continue to have this conversation. And it was at the end of either the first or the second dinner that I, classic Lindsay, I name everything. Like if there's an activity going on, I give it a name. And it's part of my creative nature and my communications background. But at the end of the dinner, I, I was thinking I'll name this so that they'll come back without any thought or planning ahead. I just decided I was going to call it the ladies dinner club. I said, well, let's call it the ladies dinner club. And would you guys mind coming back again next month? And we'll do this every month. And they all agreed. And Ladies Dinner Club continued to grow. We were filling a need that I didn't realize existed, that it wasn't just me who was looking to answer the same questions that I had running through my mind. All women had the same things. All women were trying to figure out how to work with one another. All of them were trying to figure out how to be successful and not cut one another down. And it had been created where nobody knew how to do it. And so what I learned over time was we were creating a new environment. I often liken it to a building. I was like, if you don't like the building you're in, build a new building. So in my mind, we've been creating and building a new building. Um, we've been doing it now 10, almost 11 years. I've been doing 11 years, the organization technically 10. And uh, as it grew, the name um, and the acronym LDC, and the, the serendipity that we were in DC, and they thought it was Ladies DC, not Ladies Dinner Club. So Ladies DC was born because the audience gravitated to it and they all thought that was the name. If you were to go back to our original literature and any write-ups that we had, the first website, Dinner Club, and in parentheses I would put, also known as Ladies DC, <laughs> because it was winning. So, um, you know, looking back, I never chose the name Ladies America or Ladies DC. Uh, never sat down to plan that. Anyway, uh, the cities kept growing because DC is transient. 
here to build their career and they moved back home. And inevitably what was happening is they were missing what we were offering. So they were moving back to these other cities. I would say most all of our cities, all of our cities have come through someone being affiliated with Ladies DC or they know someone who is directly involved in Ladies DC. It's not just random. They were moving there and asking if we could help them to start their chapters. And I had no idea how to do it. And I uh, went through a lot of trial and error just as an entrepreneur and creating something and really trying to figure out a model that was sustainable that could recreate and sustain. And, and it's still sometimes a struggle because the audience changes ever so slightly. I'm, I'm finding we're in this really wonderful precipice of time with women uh, where what was so organic in the beginning where there was a network of women helping each other. We now see it more and more. You see a lot of organizations that are doing that. And yes, we were doing it before all of them. But now I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, as organic as it was, because this is being offered in other places, which is fantastic. No, well, I just, I love learning about your story because it's a very organic journey. Um, but I find, uh, I've seen in my own experiences that sometimes the best businesses often come from that organic route or they, they come from, you were pursuing something else and inevitable and you and what ended up becoming the big business so to speak was something that you weren't originally pursuing it was just kind of like a side thought or something that was part of the business that ended up organically growing as the business uh, from your experience do you find that branding can come more organically in the form like ladies america absolutely um even in you know commercial businesses for example i uh at an entrepreneur event focused on Latin American women. And it was there that I was, you know, asked certain questions and I thought to myself, and one of the answers, I was like, you know, you need to have, you need to have just this authentic idea, but there has to be a need. Um, and so I do find that the successful businesses, I, I would venture to say all of them, were really, ident they had identified a need and they were, they were filling it because if you're not there's no one there there's no one there to absorb it or to buy it right um i mean even facebook was trying to achieve something right like they were trying to connect these ivy league students at harvard so that was where it started but where it went was just unbelievable it was so fascinating to people if people wanted to be part of this high you know high ivy league network i get frustrated with i sometimes is you know people taking the idea and trying to recreate it new facebook i mean those just don't work so it's sort of like find another need <laughs> and meet it you know um and but a lot of people do try to build businesses and this is where i i see that it's more uh just the sheer idea of wanting to to start a business right and it's not actually this like authentic and this need that you're feeling that organic uh, momentum often comes from, in some sense, um, uh, online brand or, or brand voice can really help sometimes in building that organic momentum. Do you have any advice for uh, young leaders who are looking to establish a stronger online brand? Absolutely. Um, I would highly recommend, and it's counterintuitive for a lot of people, but it would be um, partnering up and supporting uh, those that share in your ideas. Um, I feel like if you truly are there, um, strictly be about yourself. So I say look outside of yourself and um, just begin to identify those who maybe are doing what you want to do. If you feel a tinge of jealousy that they are doing what you want to be doing, I say go find them and support them. And in a in sense of online strategy is, you know, retweeting them or reaching out to them or creating conversations with them or, you know, posting, posting their page, just being that friendly supporter. And then you will garner their attention. Um, and then you start to develop in that respect an influence. And then um, certainly being, you know, up to date with uh, just 
educating yourself on the issues that are of interest to you. So if you are uh, into animal rights or you know, human trafficking, you know, make sure you know what you know what's current, um, and then in those connections and then those partnerships that you're following the right people, that you 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 know the influencers in your own space, and that you become an echo chamber for them. That's a really easy way to start off and to and to garner influence because I don't care who you are, even the Kim Kardashians of the world who's following them or retweeting them or reposting them. I, I was just, I saw a clip of um, Ellen DeGeneres show and one of the Kardashian girls, what's her name? Uh, oh, I can't remember the, the one of the, oh, Kendall. And she said she had removed Twitter from her phone or she quit thing. And it, apparently it made it on CNN, which is really appalling because there's this great sentence that I saw, which is stop making, I don't want to call her stupid because she's not stupid, but stop making not great people famous, you know, like let's make people famous for great reasons. But anyway, it made CNN news and um, said, well, the reason I did it is I just needed a break because it was, I would look at it at night and I would wake up and it would be the first thing I did when I woke up. And when I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, it's so similar to so many other people. And, Cause we're all looking to see like, who liked it? Who, how many people, how many people do I have that are, you know, it's sort of addictive. All of them are doing it. So no matter how big they are, um, you know, jump in, jump in. There's like, it's a free way to really engage. I would say just make sure you have balance in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. It's easy to get lost. I think I saw the same interview and I remember. Oh, thinking, you did? I, yeah, and I remember thinking to myself, I do the same thing. <laughs> like, I, I did too. Bed. First day I wake up, I was like, and I thought for just a minute, I wonder what it would be like if I didn't do that. And it, it really did make me think. <laughs> I did too. And I actually, what it did for me was, I can't believe they do the same thing as what I thought. Because in my world, it's like, can you get 200 likes, right? Um, so I just kind of figured if it, if you got up to 20,000 of something, I would stop looking, right? Like it would be like, oh, success, you know? But uh, like, wow, it doesn't matter how high you get. Yes, and I'm very true with that. And I think there's also some synergies with some of the work, um, some of your previous comment, um, you brought up in, uh, a point about um, if you have a twinge of jealousy in finding someone to actually go follow them or connect with them or support them. And I think that actually connects a little bit to this idea of um, even if you get kind of to the top, you're still comparing, you're still wanting to improve and such. What is your take on, on that approach of kind of collaboration versus competition? Because I think innately we see those who excel sometimes as threats to us and rather kind of try and do it ourselves rather than look to them as a potential colleague or collaborator. Yeah, um, I have a great story about this. Uh, it was 2009 and I had started the organization I say, you know, six or so five, and um, it was my first. It was going to be my first board, BC, because uh, I was doing everything on my own before that. So, 2009, we had elections. So I guess it was 2010. We sat down for our first meeting. The organization had um, cropped up, and it was in Northern Virginia, which is really close to DC, and it was. It was all over the place and they had amazing speakers like the top women in the city were there and they also had a full like there wasn't just a speaker which is what we were doing they had gift bags and they had um, meals and it, they had sponsors for everything and I was like oh my gosh what you know how are they doing all this and so when I sat down with the board very first board and it was the very first meeting I said we have competition and it's in northern virginia and we are gonna kill it we need to get rid of it we're going to do better than them. Blah, blah, blah. i went through this whole thing this whole tirade and largely because of business you know of success is your competition and uh i went home and i think it was just a day later that i mean i just became overwhelmed with oh my gosh what was i doing that actually goes against everything that i think and i feel and that i want 
Uh, our motto is women helping women. Why would I try to bury another women's organization? That's ridiculous. So I called an emergency board meeting right back and I uh, called them all together and I said, I want, I'm calling you together because I want to apologize for something that I did. I said that we were going to bury this other women's organization and that is not what we're going to do. In fact, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to find out how we can help them reached out to the other organization. I think I totally freaked them out because I would email them, I would call them. They knew I was running an organization that was already well established. And uh, uh, they removed me from their list. I think I was, you know, like I was bothering them. I was like, how can we help you? Let's, we'll promote this for you. We'll do whatever, because I wanted to do the opposite of what I was afraid of. Like I was afraid they were going to be better than, than we were. And instead I wanted to be, you know, like if you're better than us, awesome. And at the end of the day, they ended up just, I don't, I don't know what happened to they, like, I don't even think they were around a year and uh, I would have done everything to actually help them succeed. And we've done the same thing. We had lean in when lean in started these like groups that were cropping up around cities. We helped lean in DC launch, you know, and I, I want to continue to do that. I called us an aggregator. I started calling this an aggregator of women's organizations. It was like, we don't need to compete with them. We'll just pull all of them together and we'll make sure whoever is affiliated with us has access to all of them, knows all of them. We're promotional partners on anything. Basically, the, the criteria is, do you support women? Um, do you have influence with on major issues or, you know, do you have a large audience? Um, we have like three basic criteria and um, meet them and if they do i'll be your promotional partner we'll list them in in the work that we do the you know newsletters or outreach or online um really happy to support other groups so um the the idea is that rising tides raise all boats and um and i do believe that so if they the better they do the better we do and and that is true 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 it is always true um level. I mean, I remember there's just this amazing, 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 beautiful, beautiful uh, young woman who runs a program for young girls um, in LA. And gosh, she just, she was in a documentary and then a book. And then she was, she wasn't even in DC and she was invited to meet the first lady. And I was, and we're friends and I'm, you know, I've always been a supporter, but I felt I just felt bad, you know, it's like, why not me is what I was thinking. And I, I realized when I feel like that, I mean, it, it's uh, such a compliment. And so I made sure I texted her and I said, I just want to tell you how absolutely amazing and incredible I think you are. Like, and she wrote back and she's like, that is so crazy. I was just saying the same thing about you to so-and-so in New York two days ago. And I never would have gotten that message and it made me feel so good because I think she's just so incredible. And so I say, you know, if you feel those ways, um, go against what you, you're, you know, like that icky feeling and, and really make it something positive because there's something beautiful in there. Well, I think that also extends to you into the pers um, a perspective is something we are usually our hardest critics. So we often see everyone else and, and look at them in such a positive light and then look at ourselves in a little bit more of a critical light. So kind of understanding that they're, they, they may be looking at us in the same way, or um, I often find similar to you that like the woman you described, that those that we admire and are very kind of successful, we kind of in our, in my head, at least, I always sometimes put them in this like bubble and, and you see their outside world and the perception and you think that's all great, but we forget that they were, they're human and they started off like us at one point too, or still live a normal life in some capacity behind closed doors. Um, and I think if you find that like grounded perspective, you're right, you can make a lot of authentic connections in your network. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. With that in mind, um, in, when you are meeting new people and you're building your network, what is the first thing you notice about someone when you're networking? It seems now more than ever in my life, I'm at a point where are asking for something that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it sounds like I'm saying it in a bad way, but 
want something and, and a lot of times they want advice or they want a connection or there's something there's something that they want so the first thing now that i notice is i can tell whether or not they know what they want no matter what they're saying and i am also able to ignore what they're saying and actually see what they want so um that is the first thing that i am noticing it's like whatever someone's talking about i can just see if they mean it and if not a little bit lost and so i'll try to spend that conversation just helping them to tweak it a little bit but very subtly so um that's the primary thing i mean it's so interesting especially with young women young women in particular i don't know what it is or after you get out of college i don't know why to just say i want to do this i'm gonna do it for five years but still tell people what you want to do like yeah you, you have to work up towards it everybody knows you have to work towards it no one thinks you're going to come out of college and do you know a company but um but go ahead and say it right and instead they do this little dance and oh i want to get my foot in the door at such and such well no that's not what you want to do you want to be this right like whatever it is i want to be a uh a secret agent. I want to be, I want to work for the FBI. Okay, say that. Just tell us what it is that you want. And the reason that I say that is because if I don't actually know what you want, right? Like when somebody tells me they really want and I could tell that they mean it, my head immediately starts blowing up with names of people I can introduce them to that'll get them where they're going. Names don't pop in my head. If, they, if like literally like this Rolodex doesn't start rolling, then I, I know what they're asking for or they're not asking me for what they actually want like it's a pretty surreal thing but when somebody is being spot on about what it is that they're trying to communicate which is the whole point of networking right like it's what value are you bringing to the conversation i mean i don't see networking like this really i just i see it i see the whole world as my friend right like i've never met anyone that's not my friend like you and i are friends now even though we haven't met in person right you're, 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 it, you can't help, I can't help it. You can't help it. You're going to be part of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way it is in, in my life. And so I see it slightly differently, but you know, for most people, it is, it's a, like an value. It's a value exchange. Like what value can I bring to you without being, that's where the redefining networking, like it's just finding people you trust and you respect and, there's, there's some mutual agreement that you're coming up with. Being direct, I find, um, adds that layer of um, um, being authentic in a lot of sense. I, as you're describing your scenarios, I'm, I'm just, um, scenarios are kind of coming up in my head of like, for example, um, the classic one is always like when an entrepreneur is seeking an investor and things like that. And so they try to, in a networking scenario, connect with the investor in the room, so to speak, and they'll, a lot of the, a lot I have found, and even in my own experiences, you might strike up a conversation and and pretend and kind of talk about that you want mentorship or you want to connect or learn. But what you're really wanting is you want to know if they're going to invest in you. And I find, like you said, if you kind of dance around the topic, you build this like artificial relationship that either a they see yeah. through or b it just it just doesn't go anywhere because you're not really clear in terms of the direction of the relationship where sometimes it's not the most comfortable, like you don't feel like sometimes you get the most respect by saying what you really want. But I, I have found in my experiences, when you're very direct with executives or, or power, particularly powerful people, um, they respect you because you're to the point, they know if they can provide you value or not, you can kind of clear the air right away if a relationship is, is kind of there and then move on rather than kind of dancing around the elephant in the room, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, their their job is to what? So talk to them about their job, right? I, I mean, I still remember doing, oh my gosh, I did the same thing you just described. I had two, the, the two people who for a large bank, you know, found organizations to support. I didn't go ask them to support us. What did I do? I asked them to coffee to talk to me about how you ask someone. <laughs> I mean, it was so ridiculous, you know, and they were both looking at me like, what is she doing? I do what I walked out of there. I'm like, why did I just do that? Like, 
they gave me lessons on how to ask people and they were the two people I needed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you there. Um, yeah, I find it, I think that has to do with a little bit of just, like you said, being very clear of what you actually want. Um, sometimes I have found that initially you think you want to connect with someone because of one reason, but that if you dig deeper, the reason's a little bit different. Um, and but you kind of get again mass that surface level of oh well you want to connect with them because so-and-so and they do this but what is it really you want out of that relationship or what is that value point because in the end if you have that relationship you're exchanging value in a lot of sense it you you support your peers they support you and you like you said i love the quote you said earlier about um you rise the tides together i think right. I, that it, that really rings yeah true rising here. tides raise all boats yeah um and it doesn't end you know that's something really note is that i don't know maybe you you had this but i remember oh how old was i i think it was 17 and i felt like figured it all out like I figured out how to be happy I was happier than anyone else I was working I worked at a pizza place and I would watch all these people come in and I could see how unhappy they were they were just miserable like they were just like lemmings just getting pizza right and I remember being so philo philosophical and just feeling like I know to be happy you know um and then something in life changes and you know um and uh it was then that i just kind of felt like my boat got rocked and it was like it doesn't matter how like sort of established it doesn't matter how high up in leadership um you will continue to grow you will continue to be challenged well i think that also um goes back to also maintaining relationships too. It's not just about kind of connecting with someone, getting what you need from them and then moving on because although you might be on top of your game now and happy and, and succeeding, like you said, things can change and one of these days you might need their support and maintaining those relationships is key. So when you do fall, you have someone to help pick you back up. Definitely, yeah, that's a great point. Um, with that in mind, do you have any last um, final thoughts or tips for uh, young people out there who are looking to start to develop their network and build a quality uh, a, a quality support network? Well, you know, when you opened the those program today, you um, grabbed some of the language that I had uh, a while back about Ladies America, and it was redefining networking. And the reason that I did that is because, um, you know, network became such an overused word that I was doing. I even said that earlier. I never felt like I was networking. I just genuinely enjoy people, and I, I like supporting them, and I like being supported. You know, it feels really good. Um, so. I was trying to figure out a new word. I was like, I want a new word. Because it crawled under my skin when people would ask me about my networking group. And I would just look at them like, this isn't a networking group because that sounded so icky to me. Like, it's so much more. We're educating, connecting, we're advancing. You know, like, it's not just a networking group. And still, sometimes it kind of bothers me. So, um, there was no word. I tried everything. There's even an organization in San Francisco that was trying to start and create a women's LinkedIn and they were calling it and they wanted me to use the word constellating. <laughs> and I was like, and I can't do it because um, the word is networking. But I just thought, well, rather than change the word we're using, let's just change how we're looking at it. So that's why I started saying redefining networking. So don't look at networking in a negative light, but in um, you know, in a, in a way that you can you can offer yourself to others um, and uh, ask people for help. And I'll I'll tell you one of my favorite lines that I'd heard a long time ago, and it wasn't until probably five years ago that I re 
remembered it and finally it made sense to me and it was don't rob people of the opportunity to help you because so many times we're afraid to ask for help so i say don't rob people the opportunity to help you because we want to help you and um, and then the final thing would just be find a mentor or a couple of mentors so find someone who can invest in you and in your career and that you trust and that when you have the question about is this the right pay um you know am i making the right decision just somebody to bounce things off of from time to time is very good um, most of the time we all know in our gut the answer but sometimes you have to talk to someone to sort of pull it out of your own self and um, mentors are a wonderful way to do that i've i've always found mentors mentor um, but I always did it in a very formal way I would find someone that I was just inspired by and I would write them a letter um, of invitation to be my mentor I didn't join a mentorship program and our organization has a mentorship program but at the time there wasn't something like that that existed and um, I took it upon myself to very quite formally ask them to be my mentor and to set up a schedule on what that would look like and to agree upon it. And, and that was so helpful for me, especially when I first moved to D.C. Um, in selecting which job I would take next and so that I could um, flesh out my career in a good way, not get pigeonholed in any way and, um, and be successful. And, and my mentor certainly helped me to do that and to achieve that. So I would recommend you do that as well. Thank you, Lindsay, and I, I really appreciate your time today on Bridging the Gap. For those of you listening, now it's your turn. What do you think? Do you have any other networking tips to add or, or struggles that you want to share? Please share your thoughts using the hashtag Bridging the Gap on Twitter, and give this podcast a thumbs up if you like some of the advice Lindsay has shared. Together, we can start bridging the gap between industry and youth.